Good morning, Perth. Good night and good day to everyone else. My name is Alec Coles and I am the CEO of the Western Australian Museum based here in Perth, Western Australia. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this, the 16th International Conference on the Arts in Society. I'm sorry that not only can I not join you in person, but I cannot join you in real time either, as when you hear this, I will be in the remote Kimberley region of Western Australia. I begin, therefore, by acknowledging the Wajak Noongar people as the traditional owners of the land on which I pre-recorded this piece, the place where I live and work. I pay my respects to Wajak elders, past and present, and I also acknowledge the Bunaba peoples of the central Kimberley, on whose land I will be when you hear it. I'm now going to move into screen sharing mode, so hopefully we can get the technology to work. So the title of this keynote is inspired by three things. Firstly, a quote from CNN. Secondly, my passionate belief that museums can change our world for the better. And thirdly, our experience of creating the recently opened WA Museum Bulabardip. Bulabardip actually means many stories in local Noongar language. And implicit in that is also the concept of many voices and the principle that we can learn from others. Before I, uh, I get too far into it, I wanted to uh, really describe the nature of the Western Australian Museum. It's actually several museums, and you can see some of them here. Bottom left, you see the WA Maritime Museum and the Shipwrecks Museum, uh, both in Fremantle. Uh, top right is the uh, Museum of Geraldton. That's about 400k north of Perth. Uh, also, the Museum of the Goldfields in Kalgoorlie, uh, that's about 600k west of Perth, uh, and the Museum of the Great Southern in Albany, uh, that's about 400k south of Perth on the south coast. And then up in the top left-hand corner, we've recently taken on the management of Gunwara Maya, the Aboriginal Heritage and Cultural Centre of the Gascoigne region, based in a town called Carnarvon. Uh, over to the right, um, we have a collections and research centre, also based in Perth. And then I've just brought in from the left hand side, the new WA Museum, uh, Buda Bardip. Uh, and that's really the uh, crux of what this presentation is about. But again, before uh, getting too far into that, I did want to uh, really talk about our collections. Uh, we have something like, as it describes there, uh, 8 million items uh, in the state's collections. Uh, that's the historic reason for the museum, is to care for the state's collections. And uh, as you can see from this slide, they are many and varied, uh, covering pretty much all aspects of natural um, sciences and human endeavour. The only thing we, we don't really do is fine arts because there is a separate art gallery in Perth. Whilst the collection is critical, we had to, uh, at the beginning of our journey, evaluate and define our purpose. We did and do this through our mission statement, which is uh, that we will inspire and challenge people to explore and share their identity, culture, environment and sense of place and contribute to the diversity and creativity of our world. Now, some people remark that this does not mention museums, collections or exhibitions, and that is quite deliberate because to me, those are the tools of our trade. But this statement is actually why we do what we do. Above all, it articulates our aspiration and, as I say, our legitimate call on the public purse. Now, it's all very well having an aspirational mission, but we had to consult and convince a lot of people. And we did that through advocacy at every level. And we'll have to remember that there's something like 100 different uh, Aboriginal language groups in Western Australia, and we're also Australia's most diverse state in terms of multicultural communities. Over this period, we had to be patient, partly because consultation takes time, but also because we're dealing with a public service bureaucracy. This project was 10 years in the making. And to get there, we really had to believe in ourselves and uh, I actually go back to my old school alma mater. It was a grammar school with blazers and badges and a motto, which I've reproduced here. 
Possant quia posse videntur. Um, as a spotty teenager, I was hugely cynical about such things, but ironically, despite my ill-conceived youthful derision, uh, this has become a byline for the way that I live my life. It's from the Aeneid by the Roman poet Virgil, and it pretty much means that they can because they think they can. Appropriate then that it was a risk taken on a Roman exhibition that started our journey. When I arrived back in 2010, I was able to secure the exhibition a day in Pompeii. At that time, our board did not believe it, uh, did not believe that we could pull it off. Um, our government department uh, that we were part of did not believe it. Uh, but because I was the new kid on the block, they let me get away with it. Uh, I'm pleased to say we did pull it off. It became our most successful exhibition ever at that point. And the cues that you can see here were enough to convince a previously skeptical government of the merits of investing in a new museum. Strategic leadership is fine, but opportunistic leadership is often what gets the job done. This was very opportunistic. Uh, it almost acts like a kind of punctuated evolutionary process. The other piece of wisdom I can offer, if it can be characterised as such, is that of taking um, a few risks, calculated ones, of course. And my inspiration for this is the feisty late great Grace Hopper, uh, one of the first ever computer programmers, very involved with the development of the COBOL computer programming language, and the first woman to rise to the rank of, I think, Rear Admiral in the US Navy. Grace was a mine of amusing and insightful quotes uh, but the one that I like to live by is that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. She also said the most dangerous phrase in the English language is, we've always done it this way. Uh, I'll tell you my, um, uh, I suppose, most dangerous phrase a little bit later on. Now, it's all very well being aspirational, bullish, and dare I say a little overconfident, but there is no substitute for demonstrating what you're actually capable of. I call it advocacy by achievement. And one of our best examples of this, along with the Pompeii exhibition, was our leading the research, design and interpretation uh, in the National Anzac Centre in Albany. Uh, Anzac comes from the Australian New Zealand Army Corps who left for World War I. Built with a relatively small budget and to an almost impossible timescale, it has been a huge success and in three of its first four years of operation was voted the best museum in Australia on TripAdvisor. Imagine what confidence that instilled in the government of our abilities. We set four key aspirations for the new museum in WA. And when we released the brief to market, the first of these was design excellence. The building inside and out must have a fantastic design. And we achieved this through an extensive tender process, which narrowed things down to three teams. And the eventual winners was a joint uh, consortium between Hassel uh, uh, plus OMA. It was against an incredible field. Uh, Hassel is a, uh, it's an Australian, uh, I suppose, based company, but it's now all over the world. And OMA uh, will be known to many. Rem Coolhouse's principal architect is regularly described as the most controversial architect in the world. The design had to encapsulate the building, the content, and in particular, the integration between the two. It also meant functionality, sustainability, and the relationship and contribution to the Perth Cultural Centre, not least to the heritage buildings. The WA Museum is committed to pushing boundaries and connecting people to collections and our stories in new ways. And I think uh, Hassel plus OMA or HO as they characterise themselves for the joint venture really achieved this. Um, this is a world-class building that will build a world-class reputation for our city and our state and help build its international brand. One of the key requirements was to integrate the historic buildings with the new build. This has been one of the real architectural successes of the project. As you can see here, the Australian Financial Review critic wrote, the new museum for Western Australia brings together the old and the new in a way that takes the repurposing of heritage buildings to new heights. We wanted to des the design to create something that was exclusively West Australian. 
and that is what we got. The geological strata of WA, WA reflected in the design, the soaring cantilever galleries giving views to the space and the distant horizons that characterize this place. Uh, the city room entrance you can see there recalls a geological formation called Nature's Window in the Murchison Gorge uh, region of, of WA. And the gold glass or gold colored glass vein picks out the public circulation spaces and is inspired by a signature specimen still on display in the museum after well over 100 years, as well as reflecting WA's gold mining history. The museum needed to be activated and activatable with generous public spaces and events, uh, event spaces, performance spaces. This can be no uh, static passive experience in this day and age. Above all, the museum had to follow a principle of people first, and that is the crux of this presentation. A museum created for, by and with the people and featuring their stories, their experiences and where possible uh, told in their own words. Creating a place where people and communities will take over the museum, turn it inside out, activate its spaces and create a vibrant place where people from all over the world can come and explore, experience and share their own stories. And at the bottom there, WA Faces, which you can still find online, is where people have uploaded their portraits and told their, their stories and their experiences of WA. So why were we so committed to this approach? Well, of course, it represents um, a theoretical view of history, which allows us to explore different perspectives. And if Nietzsche did not really say that there are no such things as facts, but only opinions, then I think he probably should have done. And whilst we are supposed, uh, you know, so many quotes are misattributed or at worst pure fiction, and there is no evidence that Winston Churchill ever said history is written by the victors. And even if he did say it, he was certainly not the first to say it. But we do uh, recognize the sentiment and although it does not bear too much analysis, the fact that historical accounts are ultimately subjective gives us all pause for thought, particularly in this day and age. I actually prefer this quote from Mark Twain's Puddinghead Wilson. He says, the very ink with which history is written is merely fluid prejudice. So the challenges of presenting history in a museum context are not limited to the dangers of prejudice. They also need to take into account historiography and the ways in which historical analysis is approached. In Ian McEwan's 2019 novel, Machines Like Me, with only a touch of irony, the main protagonist rues the fact that with the ascent of a theoretical approach to history, supplanting the more traditional narrative approach, it was no longer proper to assume that anything at all had ever happened. Stan Grant is a well-known international commentator and Aboriginal man. And in his tortured thesis from the same year, Australia Day, he writes, time is a trick, it fools us. There is no time, just what we make of it. I have spoke to the physicist Carlo Rovelli about this. Time is a lie. He says, just like the flat earth, there is memory, there is no past. In similar vein elsewhere in the book, Grant writes, there are those who seek certainty, who divide the world up and take sides. I don't trust certainty. I know that in certainty, ignorance and, ign ignorance and deceit lie. Give me questions more than answers. A survey carried out in the UK in 2018 confirmed what we already knew, that museums are some of the most trusted public institutions. This is something of which we should be justifiably proud and jealously defend in the so-called post-truth era. This is a great starting point, but we have to remember that if people are looking for certainty for absolute truths, they will not find them here, particularly with the approach that we have taken. They will in fact find many truths. I've always believed that museums should be the kind of places where difficult subjects can be approached without the confrontation or rancor that we so often see in the media. They should be debating chambers with respect, 
hustings with empathy. Out of this comes the idea of safe places for unsafe ideas. Uh, a phrase, a phrase coined um, by Elaine Hyman Urian many years ago, and one that has stuck. What better places to explore those more contentious historical issues? Apologies for the fuzziness of that slide. Things don't always work out the way you wish. When the National Museum of Australia opened in Canberra, it had a strong Aboriginal content. Some of it was considered controversial at the time. In truth, it is not, uh, and it's certainly not what we consider unusual today, but at that time it became embroiled in the so-called history wars. It became the subject of intense political interference and was tainted for many years thereafter. Um, its director, Dawn Casey, was treated abominably, in my opinion. So we decided very early on that the way to address these contested and differing uh, histories and perspectives was to engage as many West Australians as possible to tell their own stories and share their own thoughts. There were many ways in which we did this, but in short, we consulted over 54,000 people, and that included over 60 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, different uh, language groups and communities. And as you can see here, we went to many different locations around our enormous state uh, uh, to speak to people uh, if, necessary, if necessary in remote areas. One of the things we did was to appoint um, community liaison officers, and these were people based in uh, particularly regional, but not exclusively regional, also some of the metro areas, in uh, Aboriginal uh, communities. And they were people from those communities, so we weren't parachuting people in. They engaged with the community, uh, they engaged with the elders, and they collected stories and objects. They sought cultural permissions, uh, and they worked with the museum to determine display and interpretation protocols. This was key to our approach um, and the principle that we adopted very early on, that we would not speak for people who can speak for themselves. And as you might imagine, uh, that uh, presents plenty of challenges in collecting uh, the stories in the first place. Uh, but also in terms of the way that people receive and engage with them in the museum. And uh, uh, we've not shied away from contentious issues, from confronting issues. And uh, I think people have actually ultimately appreciated that. But inevitably, there are some people who were possibly used to what they believed was a, a traditional view of history uh, who find that quite confronting. Um, Another thing we did was uh, prior to opening, we developed different models of uh, creating exhibitions. And these are just two examples. Uh, on the left, luster, pearling in Australia. Um, pearling uh, off Australia, well, Western Australia's Northwest coast has been long established, but many people don't realize just how long uh, the collection and the trading of pearl shell has taken place. So whilst the, the pearling industry is really, you know, as an industry, probably not much older than, uh, uh, than the back end of the last century, uh, the, um, the trading of pearl shell by Australia's first peoples goes back 20,000 years and more and is now well uh, established. And so in developing Lustre, which was an exhibition about that, we uh, engaged uh, curators uh, from the Kimberley region, uh, which is where this uh, really the, the story takes place. Uh, people from uh, Nyumba Buruyaru, uh, which is the, um, the Aboriginal uh, um, cooperation uh, based in Broome, uh, but also as well as working with Yaru people, working with Barijawi, uh, Mayala uh, and Garajari people up there to create a rich story that was told uh, through their voices. And we also engaged two young Aboriginal curators to work on this. So this was a, I like to think a model in co-curation. Uh, on the right-hand side, a similar thing. We worked 
with the Manang people of um, the Albany region uh, in the south, uh, the southern part of West uh, Western Australia, uh, to create Yulmun Makari Miyabuja, uh, which basically means returning to Makari's country, and this involved. Uh, borrowing back all the Manang items in the British Museum in London back onto country. Uh, again, the um, uh, Albany uh, uh, Albany Heritage Reference Group Aboriginal Corporation, uh, all local Aboriginal people were intimately involved in developing and curating this exhibition. And as I say, I think this this provided the uh, the touchstone for us to move forward. So what's actually in the uh, the museum, uh, Buddha Bardup? Uh, well, the first thing you encounter, the only exhibition that you will encounter on the ground floor, on country, as we say, is an exhibition called Narankurt Bujawurn. And as you see there, it means our heart, our country, our spirit. And uh, it provides a welcome uh, onto, uh, onto country, it provides uh, a real orientation point, particularly for people not from uh, Western Australia, in terms of um, Australia's First Peoples, uh, Aboriginal culture, particularly local Wajak Noongar culture, and then draws you in to the uh, wider communities, cultures and language groups uh, based in Western Australia. And as you progress through it, uh, you will see and engage with great uplifting stories of uh, Aboriginal people who have achieved uh, great accolades in sport, in politics, in culture, in the arts. And there are lots of uplifting stories, but there are also some pretty tough stories as well um, about the stolen generations, about the massacres that occurred uh, when the first uh, European invaders arrived. And one of the ongoing shameful elements of our state, the uh, the terrible uh, number of uh, Aboriginal deaths in custody. So Nalankot Bujiwaran um, pulls no punches in that respect. And if you want to learn about Aboriginal culture, but how Aboriginal people experience it, this is the gallery that you'll visit. couple of quotes really to back that whole principle up. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage, it need not be lived again, uh, Maya Angelou. And uh, uh, I'd like to think that's a real um, uh, motto for the way we've approached Nalankurat Pujiwaran. And uh, George Santayana, famous quote there, those who don't re do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Although Nalankurt Bujiwaran is, if you were, the Aboriginal Cultural Materials Gallery in the museum, one of uh, eight large permanent galleries, uh, Aboriginal voices are expressed throughout the whole of the museum. So in Origins, uh, which is land, water, sky, really deals with the, I guess, the beginning of the universe, the creation of the universe, uh, right up to the most contemporary scientific studies today. But throughout, it's told in parallel, um, parallel fashion. So again, Aboriginal voices greet you into the uh, into the gallery, and tell the story, um, balancing, I suppose, or, or harmonising the Aboriginal views of the creation, uh, along with um, the, I suppose, what geologists uh, believe is the uh, the origin of the earth today and uh, through that crystal portal there you can see a model of one of uh, western australia's most uh, significant landscapes the um, um, so-called bungle bungles uh, the beehive uh, formations in pernalulu again up north in the kimberley uh, but that whole section is interpreted by the local gija people uh, and that really enriches, I think, the experience for the audience. Changes is an interesting gallery because this charts the impact that humans have had on the uh, landscape of Western Australia. 
uh, as you can see the title on the right there, you can even change the nature of the title to uh, illustrate the point. And the uh, the thing on the left hand side, which you don't really get the sense of scale, that's about as as tall as me, and I'm yeah, not for two meters high. Uh, that is a model of a wrecking ball that they used to pull through the forests and basically decimated these forests to create agricultural land over time. But one of the key elements, again, thinking of the um, uh, the first people's voices here, for a long time, people considered there was no supposed agriculture uh, in Australia prior to the arrival of Europeans. Uh, this is now known to be uh, completely untrue. Uh, Aboriginal peoples have managed the land uh, in all kinds of ways, uh, particularly but not exclusively uh, using fire for uh, many, many millennia. And um, uh, this is an important element of this gallery that takes us right through from that uh, early uh, some people would describe as fire stick farming right through to the uh, most, um, uh, I suppose, impactful uh, changes today. Not all of them bad, but not all of them good either. Uh, Connections is the um, gallery that uh, deals with Western Australia's place in the world. Uh, our relationship is uh, strongly with the Indian Ocean. Um, much of the rest of populated Australia uh, talks, if you like, to the Pacific, but our uh, main uh, ocean border is the Indian Ocean. And so that plays a huge part here. This is about how people came here, why they came here, where they came from. And again, uh, looks from the first diasporas of the first peoples that would have arrived here uh, from I guess an Asian landmass, uh, literally tens of millennia ago, uh, right up to the um, migrants of today, but also particularly refugees and asylum seekers. And one of the little known things is that um, Western Australia is now Australia's most uh, multiculturally diverse state. It's something that I think we're both proud of and enriches us enormously. Uh, innovations uh, is pretty much what it says it is, and it uh, looks at all kinds of uh, both, uh, well, I suppose scientific, technological, artistic, creative innovations, medicine, fashion, technology, mining, obviously, um, digital developments, uh, got a really flourishing uh, virtual and augmented reality, uh, reality industry here in WA. Uh, and again, uh, it takes those innovations from all parts of the community. And uh, people will find some pretty familiar uh, stories in there, but they will find some extraordinary stories that they had no idea uh, about things that were going on here in WA as well. Reflections, our people, our stories. As I said earlier, we actually engaged with something like uh, 54,000 people in different ways. And part of what we did was collect new stories. And uh, these are told visually, um, uh, hourly, uh, through traditional and digital media. Uh, not every one of the 54,000, I have to say, got their story in, which I'm sorry about that. But all of this is augmented by a digital application, which means that we can continually add content without necessarily needing to redesign the infrastructure of the building. Uh, and so this this gallery is a, a social history literally uh, told through the words of our people. And wildlife, it's interesting for those who've never been to Western Australia, you look at it on a map um, and uh, it often looks quite featureless. Um, I know that um, my mother who lives in the UK is convinced that I live in the middle of a desert. Uh, I don't. I live in one of the uh, top 30 uh, biodiversity hotspots in the world. Uh, WA has an incredible diversity uh, of plants and animals, uh, something to, to rival the tropics actually in many ways. Uh, and it also has an incredible history 
uh, of the evolution of that diversity as well. And this is a story that's it's really important to tell. This, of course, is the gallery where you'll find you know, the dinosaurs, the dinosaur footprint fossils. Uh, you'll find the stories of the, the giant sharks that used to uh, roam the seas, the megalodons. And uh, needless to say, we put this at the top of the building to make sure that, uh, that all the kids made their way right the way up there. And um, finally, the Stan Perrin WA Treasures Gallery. Um, and uh, again, this is a, a really important gallery uh, for us featuring um, treasures from all around WA, but particularly Otto, the blue whale um, skeleton that is uh, everyone who used to visit the museum uh, back in the early part of the last century. It's everybody's favorite exhibit. And I'm pleased to say, uh, there he is, looking amazing. Uh, we have a, a, a purpose-built temporary exhibition space, and I was delighted that the uh, first exhibition we were able to show was from the National Museum in Canberra. Uh, we were the first um, site after the National Museum on what will become or has become a big international tour. Song Lies tracking the, tracking the Seven Sisters uh, was many years in the making on country with Aboriginal communities in Western Australia, largely in the Mardu lands, the Nyanitjara lands, and, uh, and then out into um, South Australia, a bit of the Northern Territory in the APY lands. Uh, it was described by a very prominent art critic as the most uh, important exhibition uh, created in Australia. And uh, hopefully, uh, as it goes around the world, you'll get the chance to see it. It is stunning and there's nothing I can say about it that would do it justice. You have to go and see it. Uh, obviously, uh, learning is key to what we're doing. It's a key priority for Buddha Bharat and we're providing many opportunities there and a huge range of education programs for uh, children, adults alike, formal and informal learning. And so I go back to my title, because I always say they said it would never happen. It did. They said no one would be interested. They were. Uh, they said it wouldn't be any good. Uh, as I make this recording, uh, which is just towards the end of May, we opened on November 21. We've had 470,000 visitors through so far, which is way ahead of our uh, projections and certainly way ahead of what anybody expected. And um, where I took my title from was from CNN, who described the museum back in 2019 as one of the most anticipated buildings set to shape the world uh, in 2020. And I definitely hope that that's what I'm uh, doing. I threw in a couple of quotes at the end, as you probably gathered. I do like uh, I do like to uh, find quotations to support um, our principle and. Uh, uh, I remember speaking to a, a group of history teachers and I threw this one in the history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. That was uh, Stephen Dallas in uh, James Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, but again, it doesn't take too much translation to apply that um, to the uh, the plight of our first peoples here in Australia and indeed first peoples in many parts of the world. Uh, so let's hope what we've done uh, is helping them awake from that. Uh, my second quote is much more lighthearted. This was from um, a young visitor, uh, was uh, a friend of one of uh, my staff member's daughter. I think she was seven at the time. And she said, I love museums because you can learn new stuff from old stuff. And uh, if that isn't a motto for what we're about, I don't know what is. Um, so there we are. I uh, will uh, now uh, try and come back to you. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure to present this to you. I'm sorry uh, again that I couldn't be with you or indeed be with you there in real time, uh, but uh, I wish you all the very best uh, for the conference. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry I'm not there to answer questions, but uh, uh, my details, I'm sure, will be in the in the program. It's uh, alec.coles at uh, uh, museum.wa.gov.au. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, hear from you 
uh, in due course. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, hope to see you all in Western Australia when we can all move around a bit more easily. Thank you.